All right, I'm recording. Now, the PowerPoint's doing weird things, so I'm just seeing if it's working. Yeah, look at that. All right, so uh, we're going to be looking at energy stores and systems and everything that come up in topic three of the foundation tier paper. So um, here we have some energy stores and we have pathways. We can also call these transfers. I will probably end up calling them transfers because that's it's, it's the way I was uh, the way I was taught to say it. That's the way I'm going to do it. So we have to know the different stores and transfers. And the easiest way I can describe the difference between a store and a transfer is this. Uh, first off, what is energy? Energy is the ability, or the allowance, to do work. And work is when stuff happens. One of the simplest ways to think about it is energy allows forces to do whatever forces do. The way we symbolize this normally is to think of an energy store as a thing and a transfer as an action into another thing. So all forces are is a way of getting energy from one thing to another thing, from one area to another area, from one scenario to another scenario. Forces move energy from one store into another store. And forces is one kind of transfer, but this or pathway, all pathways and all transfers work the same way. They move energy from one store into another store and when that happens stuff happens these energy stores allow pathways to do stuff an example would be uh, if i have a bar of chocolate I eat that bar of chocolate, and I then use that bar of chocolate to, um, I don't know, run away from a bear. I don't know why I'm so happy to be running away from a bear, and also I don't know quite how I managed to break all of my limbs. So what's actually allowing me to move away? Well, it's the force of my legs pushing against the ground. That's an inverted knee, I think. Not too sure. But the chemical store in the chocolate bar gave, allowed the force of my legs to move me, increasing the store of energy that I have for movement. The chemical store in the food allowed the force to transfer energy to the kinetic store in my body allowing me to move. Another example. Um, we've got an object that's really high up off the ground. Let's say it's 10 meters high. It has got a store of energy that allows it to fall when released to the bottom of where to hit the ground wherever it is. And as it's falling down, it's moving. So there's another store of energy in this object that's moving. The store in the thing is gravitational potential energy. And the gravitational potential energy allows gravity to pull the object down, increasing its kinetic energy store. One last one. Um, let us say I have got a camp stove. And on this camp stove, I put a bowl of soup. The camp stove has a store, the gas in the camp stove has got a store of chemical energy. And I can transfer that energy into a thermal store in the soup when I want it to warm up. And that transfer is called heating. So when that transfer occurs, this object, my soup, gains energy as thermal energy and it's warmer. I'm going to leave those there. We can have a look at the different stores and pathways.
And then we can talk about gravitational potential energy. Gravitational potential energy is in objects that are above the ground. GPE is an energy store that allows objects to fall. Do not confuse gravitational potential energy with gravity. GPE doesn't do anything. Potential energy doesn't do anything. An object that is raised high will have gravitational potential energy, but that does nothing. The force of gravity is a doing thing. It's an action. It does something. Gravity pulls the object down. The equation to calculate gravitational potential energy is delta GP equals m times g times delta H. Now, that triangle can be called delta, or is called delta, pardon me, and it means change in maths. Not chamji, change. Now, if you want to see the video on how to do maths properly, go and watch that. But please do the maths properly. Collect your terms on the left hand side, do your working out on the right hand side. It doesn't matter if you substitute first or rearrange and see if you get the right answer. Okay, voila. Moving objects have kinetic energy. More kinetic energy generally means you've either got a larger object or a larger velocity, larger speed. K equals one half mv squared. Kinetic energy is one half times m times v squared. Squared is important and often forgotten. Do not forget. I'm going to leave this on the screen. You can have a read and try the maths. So we'll pause. And here's your answer. And we'll often use this word or this term, an energy system. And it's just a group of objects that have the ability to do work. Remember, energy allows work to happen. And work is making stuff happen. Work is the actual action of doing stuff. Think of energy as being a noun type word and work being a verb type word. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. So when work is done, we simply transfer energy from one store along a pathway to another store. And this work is an action, something happens. An energy flow diagram shows that whole process, labeling the pathways and the stores. Here's an electric shaver. The battery has got a chemical energy store. The current flows through an electrical pathway to the motor. And the motor follows a mechanical pathway. That just means some kind of a physical force. The mechanical pathway is going to make these little blade things spin about the place. It's going to get hot because of the friction between the blades in themselves and also the blades in the skin. And there'll be a radiation pathway to a sound store. Though sometimes we say that sound itself is a transfer. It just depends on the context. So this energy flow diagram, chemical energy in the battery, goes through an electrical transfer to a motor, which converts that electrical transfer into a mechanical transfer to increase the kinetic store, allowing those disks to spin. Also increases the thermal store, making the shaver and the motor warm. And the sound store that doesn't really exist, but sometimes pops up in some papers and questions, because you can hear things. But what's sound then? Well, ultimately, sound is a transfer. And instead of saying sound, it would actually just be a second thermal store. But I can almost guarantee that won't come up. It's a bone of contention. So you have to know some specific examples of energy, energy changes in systems. I'm going to go through those now. An object thrown upwards, like somebody throwing a tennis ball upwards. When the ball leaves the hand, it has a store of kinetic energy. It'll reach to a point where it's no longer going upwards, and that will be where it has a gravitational potential energy store that has been filled by the kinetic energy store being transferred by forces to the GPE store. And then it falls back down again. So the gravitational potential energy store is transferring into the kinetic energy store by the force of gravity.
And again, you can pause these and read. I don't have to tell you. You can if you want to. Moving object, hitting an obstacle. So you're throwing a bowling ball down an alley. So when you move the muscles of your arm to throw the ball, the chemical energy store in your muscles decrease and the kinetic energy store of the bowling ball increase. So we have chemical energy, CE, being transferred by forces into a kinetic store. Chemical energy of the arm transferring into the kinetic energy of the ball through the mechanical pathway or the forces pathway, both the same thing. Now, when the ball hits the pin, the ball has kinetic energy. It will transfer through forces some of that energy to the pin, giving the pin kinetic energy. And the pin will move. It's also going to transfer some to a thermal store, get a little bit warm. It will also transfer a little bit of thermal energy to the air around the bowling ball and the pin. And you can experience that. All, all, of, these, all of these transfers will be done through forces. And again, there'll be a sound store or a sound transfer occurring too. And again, pause if you want to. An object being accelerated by a constant force, like a bowling ball being dropped off a skyscraper. I'm going to label this as a bad idea. Let's not do that. But at its highest point, my ball has got a store of gravitational potential energy. Gravity does work on the ball through a mechanical pathway, and it will accelerate towards the ground. As it's moving, its kinetic store will be increasing. Because the energy has been transferred from the gravitational potential energy store by gravity into a kinetic energy store. No, seriously, don't do this. Vehicle slowing down. So my moving lorry has got a store of kinetic energy. When we use brakes, which again use forces, there will be an increase in the thermal energy of those brakes. There will also be a sound. And that sound, which is kind of a just pathway, not a store, will increase the thermal energy of the surroundings. So here we're having the increase in thermal, uh, thermal energy of the brakes, and here, increase in thermal energy of the air. I'll we'll also mention this actually, as your ball is falling, it's not only making a kinetic energy store in the ball, it's also increasing the thermal energy store of the air. Whenever anything moves through air, in the surroundings, and actually when I say air as well, instead of just saying air, I'm also going to say the word environment or surroundings. Okay, so the things that are around whichever things we're talking about. Now, eventually when my car, when my, when my big truck stops, if it had 100 joules of kinetic energy, all that kinetic energy will have been transferred by forces into 100 joules of thermal energy. Sprinkle some water on the brake pads of your car, not your car, but the car that you have access to, after you're back from a drive someday and see just how hot the, 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 the wheels actually, the, the metal of the wheels actually get. So here's your tire. Um, you'll have some kind of a central disc and then either an alloy or some kind of a, a covering on it. You'll see a metal circle and attach that metal circle. It'll be a big drummy thing. Throw some water at that metal circle and you'll see it fizzle. Bringing water to boil an electric kettle. So we've got some kind of an electrical transfer. And it's going into the element, which is a, if you ever look at the kettle, it's like a big loop of wire at the bottom of the kettle. And it's going to be increasing the thermal energy store of the element, the, the bit of metal that heats up inside the kettle. The thermal energy of that element will be transferred to the water by heating. So the water will gain a thermal 
store. It will also gain a kinetic energy store because the water is moving. The healthy pop down here is something for you to remember as well. Energy is measured in joules. One kilojoule is 1,000 joules, and one megajoule is 1 million joules. And pause it if you want to read it. Here's some questions. Hit the pause and do the questions. Nothing on earth rhymes with questions. Maybe I could try rhyming it with sections. That doesn't rhyme at all. I might as well have said Bob. More questions. And here are your answers. Again, pause them so you can read the answers and see if your work was correct. Alakazam. Woo. Yippee. And again. Boom. Okay, conservation of energy. So what we're going to be looking at now is this idea that and so we are, we, hopefully we now understand this idea that energy is transferred from one store into another store, store through a pathway, through a transfer. And when that transfer occurs, it's that transfer that does something. But this is super important. It's called the law of conservation of energy. Energy can be stored, transferred, or dissipated, but cannot be created or destroyed. Dissipated means lost to the surroundings. Most of the time, we, we spend a lot of time trying to avoid that because energy costs us. It costs us in cash and it costs us in global warming. And a lot of our energy stores come from fossil fuels, which isn't very good. So the amount of energy going into a closed system, and remember, an energy system is just a group of objects. The amount of energy in will be equal to the amount of energy out. Now, this is a Sankey diagram. You don't know how to do these. There is a video for that as well on the channel. You can go and have a look at it. But it shows us that um, for a light bulb, all right? So this is a, a diagram for a light bulb. The amount of electrical energy going into the light bulb is demonstrated by the width of this arrow. So this width is 100% of the energy going in. This width represents the amount of energy that's given off as light. This width is the amount of energy that's given off as thermal energy. Now, do I want my light bulb to be hot or do I want my light bulb to be shiny? Well, it's not called a heating bulb. So really what I want is lots of shininess. I want lots of light coming out of it. We call this energy here useful. This energy here, waste. We say that any energy that goes into the waste column, the waste bit, is dissipated. Energy lost to the surroundings, not used usefully. Unwanted energy transfers result in stores that are not useful. The amount of chemical energy that goes into a Formula One car. All I want for my car to do is to go from A to B super, super fast, meaning all I want is lots of kinetic energy. But unfortunately, I've also got this sound energy. And the friction of the tires on the road and the air battering against the side of the car all increase the thermal store of the air. And eventually, the kinetic energy of my car is also going to be wasted as thermal energy. Even the sound that the car makes is a waste. I want all of my energy possible to go to the kinetic store. Anything that isn't kinetic is a waste. This is why we use oils and other lubricants. If we can minimize the friction in the engine, then we will get less thermal energy in the engine. Now, we can't lubricate the tires, but if you ever look at Formula One tires, you'll see that they are quite smooth. In fact, they rely a lot on heating up. And actually, this is a 
complete tangent. I'm not doing this because there's no one in the classroom to distract me, so I'm just going to stick with what I'm saying. Stop it, Mikhail. We use oil in the engine and on other moving parts as a lubricant to reduce friction and therefore reduce unwanted thermal energy. Just a reminder that friction is when we have two surfaces, surface A and surface B. So when surface A is moving over surface B and they're touching, this is called friction. Friction is a force, it is a transfer, it is not a store. So we can use lubrication to reduce unwanted energy transfers, and we can also use what's called insulation. So insulation is just about reducing the amount of energy that is transferred from our, from our system into waste. All the energy used to heat a home is eventually transferred as thermal energy to the surroundings. There's no way of getting around that. However, what we can do is insulate the building to reduce the amount of energy that is wasted at one time. Thermal, meaning heat, conductivity, is how easy it is for heat to get from one place to another. So here's an example of air. We're going to have air as A, and we're going to have uh, concrete down here as well. Concrete is C. So if I have heat traveling through air, and heat traveling through concrete, they take a different amount of time to get through. Heat will get through concrete much faster than it would through the same thickness of stagnant air. Sorry, there's someone in the room here who just needs a second of my time. Sorry, wait now. Okay. Not doing this video again. Pause. Uh, no. Oh, goodness gracious. Right. Can I just talk to you in just two minutes? Thank you. Okay. Right. Um, I don't know what I was saying. I think it was here. The higher the thermal conductivity, the quicker the heat is transferred through the material. So, um, oh yeah, air. Right. So, air and concrete. If I have got the same um, length, uh, if I've got the same thickness of air and concrete, then it would actually take heat a lot longer to get through my air from point A to point B than it would to get through my concrete from point A to point B. But we often use brick, concrete, wood and glass for building our houses. And these things all let, so here we are, where are we now? Um, brick, glass, concrete, um, where's wood? And uh, there's wood, right. We use these things to get, uh, to build our houses, which means um, that we're likely to lose a lot of, of heat. Now, I can't build my house out of foam or air, so I've got to use these really conductive materials, but there are tricks that we can do. So we might have fiberglass in the loft, so we might put a layer of fiberglass up here in the top, glass wool, and that will reduce the amount of thermal energy being able to go out through the attic. We build walls. We don't just build a house with one wall. We build them a lot of the time with two walls. And in between, there's, in, and, then, and there's the house. So what we're doing is we're looking at the, at the house. Here's the front door, whatever. There will be one layer of bricks here and another layer of bricks here. And in between, we would have air or foam, most likely foam, because the air would be able to go in and out with the bricks and it wouldn't work. And when there's foam in between these bricks, it stops the heat from getting out. The same idea for double glazing. So if I get one layer of glass here, and another layer of glass here, and I trap air in between, it reduces the amount of heat that's able to get out quickly, the amount of, the amount of energy that's able to get out quickly, the amount of transfers that can go through that system. Now, we do all this so that we can save the amount of energy that's in our house and reduce the amount of energy that's being wasted. And the term that we use for this is efficiency. So efficiency is all about, or, or the term efficiency is, use, is referring to the amount of useful energy that you get from an energy transfer compared to the energy going in. So here's your equation. It will result in a decimal value. If you can multiply it by 100, you'll get a percentage. What do I mean by the amount of useful energy, the amount of total energy? 
let's just say that I've got a, um, I have a dishwasher because even I control one of those. That's not a dishwasher, it's a washing machine. Goodness gracious. And let's just say that there's a transfer into my washing machine of 100 joules of um, 100 joules and it's been transferred in uh, electrically. My dishwasher washing machine is going to need to have some kinetic energy to go around and around and around and around and around. You ever just sit and watch a washing machine? It's very therapeutic. It's also going to have an increased store of thermal energy in the water, which is good. I want my water to be nice and hot, to get my clothes nice and clean. So this is all going to be in the um, washing machine, kinetic energy and thermal energy in my washing machine. But there's also going to be some energy, some thermal energy. Why? 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 Transfer to the air, to the surroundings. Remember, we call this dissipation. So let's just say that I get um, 20 joules of kinetic energy and 20 joules of thermal energy in my water. 100 joules went in, 20 joules I want. That means that there's 60 joules over here of energy that I don't want. The amount of useful energy you get from an energy transfer is here compared to the energy put in is here. So if I wanted to find the efficiency of my, water, my, 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 my washing machine, I would do the useful energy divided by the total energy. 20 plus 20 is 40 divided by 100. That will give me my decimal value of 0 0.4 times it by 100 will give me 40%. And there's another example of that here. The most common way that materials waste um, energy is through friction. Electrical circuits always heat up because, as we know, when an electron collides with a positive nucleus, the positive nucleus starts to oscillate more. The increase in oscillation increases the kinetic energy of the positive nuclei. The increase in the kinetic energy increases the thermal energy of the, of the positive nuclei. This reduces the amount of current but increases the temperature of the wire. Please know this, very important. Nothing to do with this, but it is something that you need to know. And thermal energy can, will always move from an area that's hot to an area that's cold. Always will. No way of avoiding it. Sound energy and therm and um, yeah. Just be aware that they might call sound energy a, 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 a transfer. Generally, they don't. We, we don't really talk about sound at GCSE, but that's fine. Mechanical devices can be more efficient by lubrication. It reduces energy transferred by friction. Remember, two surfaces rubbing over each other. And having good insulation reduces the rate of thermal energy transfers, as we talked about. Here are the questions. P -p -p Pause. 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 Piddly widdly pause. And here are your answers. Boom. There you go. And this is the last one. All right. So. Again, thank you for putting up with this if you've been listening all the way through it. It's, uh, it's hard to be interesting to a computer, so thank you very much for staying around. Any questions? Don't leave comments because I don't know how to access them. Do send us an email or talk to us when we get back to school. Bye.